I call on Government Order of the Day number one. Adjourned debate on the second reading of the Appropriation 2016-17 Estimates Bill and the amendment pro proposed to it. The Honourable Jerry Brownlee. Uh, Mr Speaker, I'm very pleased to speak in support of the motion moved by the Honourable Bill English and to encourage my colleagues in their condemnation of the amended motion moved by Andrew Little. Mr Speaker, Budget 16 uh, has been entitled a budget for growth. It continues the approach of Prime Minister John Key, uh, Finance Minister Bill English, the Cabinet, the caucus and indeed the National Party in being responsive to the needs of people while balancing those expectations against the ability to deliver. Mr Speaker, that however is not the big story of the day. The big story of the day is that the reaction to this budget, positive as it's been from the general public, has caused the Labour Party and the Green Party to enter into some sort of a bachelor, 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 bachelorette type uh, production, handing each other a rose and indicating the grand coalition of opposition parties into the future. I want to know who's Naz and who's Fleur. And I want to know, above all, who is Jordan? Who is Jordan? Because there can only be one leader. And what have we got here? We've got Andrew Little with Grant Robertson off shaking hands with them now. Grant's really the leader of the Labour Party. And we've got Materia Turo and James Shaw, who of course is also the leader of the Green Party, battling it out for that Jordan role. And I guess that makes Andrew, uh, that makes Grant Robertson Naz. And of course, Materia Turo, the lovely blue. <laughs> Mr Speaker, what's this mean long term for politics in New Zealand? It has to mean uh, that some of the died in the wall view that there is uh, only one way, the way of the left, to deliver prosperity for New Zealanders is going to continue. The really interesting thing about uh, today also was that Grant Robertson, the uh, Labor spokesman on finance, revealed to the House that he had read as far as 1.1 in the budget. The sad news for him is that there aren't enough question times between Budget 216 and Budget 217 for him to be able to indicate he's read all the way to the end of it. Mr Speaker, that of course will be evident to anybody who listens to him delivering some of his uh, more crazy policy statements uh, and particularly anyone who wants to... Now I'm not going to suggest you go and look at the interview on the weekend, but if you have got insomnia, go for it. You're going to kill yourself in no time at all. Mr Speaker, one of the most interesting things about the very impressive figures in this uh, uh, budget uh, is to have a look at some of the assumptions that are behind it, because they are extremely conservative, extremely conservative. So when we have uh, questions today about what will the average wage be in, in four or five years' time, uh, etc., uh, those sort of questions can only be answered in time, but the questioner needs to look at the assumptions made in the budget, because they are conservative, which means that while there is optimism in the budget, that is also constrained in the possibilities for New Zealanders if they stick with the current regime and the current way in which we're delivering for, the, for them, uh, then the outlook should be considerably better. For example, sir, it's only predicting a very, very gradual e easing in growth of trade by New Zealand uh, into other countries. No other government has pursued trading options with the same vigour as this country as this government. And this government will continue to do so. So that is a conservative estimate of what trade may mean for us in the future. The other point is that it talks about recovery of commodity price on a very slow basis. We all know that we're about at the bottom and that there is that slow rise, but it can take off at any time. The world is not getting smaller and nor is demand. Mr Speaker, there is absolutely no chance that oil prices will double in the next four years. Yet that is the assumption inside this budget. And that has huge effect uh, potentially on the savings that many businesses will make in their operation out to 2020. Mr Speaker, migration flows are also strong in this country and predicted to fall off. But why would they fall off when we're a country that is safe, that is stable and that is predictable and where life can be lived more freely than any other nation in the world. And it doesn't matter how many times our opponents like to go out and point 
out some of the less desirable aspects of New Zealand society, the fact remains, compar comparatively to other countries, we are an absolute paradise. Mr Speaker, I want to um, talk a little bit uh, about uh, uh, the uh, specifics in this budget. And uh, the first one I've got to say is uh, around the issue of science and innovation uh, and the whole idea that research is going to uh, produce more value for New Zealand. So you've only got to look in the budget where it talks about uh, some of the aspects of uh, how the New Zealand economy grows, and particularly look in the area of, um, uh, what is it, uh, non-service-based manufacturing, which is now equal to our dairy exports. Now equal to our dairy exports. That doesn't happen without there being some kind of encouragement. So the 760 odd million that's going into that uh, over the next period of time is supporting an industry that over a relatively small period of time has become a $15 billion industry. That's the sort of investment that's smart and that's worthwhile and it's appalling that our opponents are condemning that sort of activity. Then, sir, looking at uh, the, the core services, so health, a huge winner in this budget. And all our opponents can say is because the, we were putting so much money and getting such terribly uh, ineffective service uh, and now National's getting more out of it, we must be squeezing it. Well, sir, those deliveries of health services come from the professionals who respect the way the National Government has engaged with them over a period of time. And this year, Dr Coleman has been able to get a significant increase in funding, over $500 million for the year. I've pointed out to him on numerous occasions what others could have bought for that particular $500 million, but I want to assure him there's no bitterness on my part. I think that uh, getting that money for health is absolutely essential and in line with the expectations of New Zealanders. When it comes to education, an $880 million rebuild program across the education delivery uh, services of New Zealand. Recognising, as was raised today by an opposition member in a half-hearted sort of way, that education is changing. The needs are changing, the modes of delivery are changing, and this government is keeping well and truly ahead of that, Mr Speaker. I want to speak uh, specifically about uh, Christchurch, where I've obviously had uh, a big engagement over the last uh, few years. Sir, the government expenditure in Christchurch under this budget rises to about $17.5 billion dollars. Uh, that is a huge amount of expenditure uh, by any government on any one aspect of its, uh, of its requirements. Uh, and there has been no stinting of funding available for Christchurch. Uh, and in fact, the generous way in which the Prime Minister has taken a personal interest in Christchurch uh, is largely to do uh, with the fact that uh, we have successfully gone into a transition period uh, where we are seeing a return to local government at all levels inside the Christchurch City Council. But what I do want to signal, sir, is that uh, inside that $17 billion, uh, there is all of the money that goes into EQC, and I want to congratulate EQC for the work that they've done. They're very easily criticised. They're down now uh, to about the last two or three hundred cases that are the hardest of all to deal with. And they're making every effort to ensure that they are uh, off the books uh, by the mid part of next year. Mr Speaker, in a normal circumstance, if someone loses a house to a fire, it's around about 18 months before they get uh, settlement and able to move on because of all the various activities that happen to have to take place uh, around those investigations, etc. For EQC, inside five years, to have dealt with 167,000 repairs, as well as another 40-odd thousand overcaps that have gone off the private sector is a huge undertaking and a great tribute uh, to the board and staff of EQC. Mr Speaker, uh, I said earlier that this was a growth, uh, a budget for growth. That's how it's been characterised. I think that's how it's seen by New Zealanders. And I think the reaction today from our opponents of suddenly recognising that if they are to get some sort of a movement forward, they're going to have to hold hands, if not swap flowers. But there are dangers in that. I was just thinking before, Phil Twyford has managed to change his views on housing substantially over the eight, last 18 months, swinging more towards the sort of policies national happen. Now you can expect him to come back into the House next week and saying the new Labor policy is 
more houses, but they must have thatched roofs, be built of mud, and have jammed our windows. Mr. Speaker, that is no future for this country.